Hey, warm welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today and for joining so promptly as well. We are very excited to be sharing headline find findings today from five years of our group's research into the links between arts and cultural engagement and population health, coinciding with the launch today of a key summary report of over 70 of our papers in this area and our new group website, svbresearch.org. We are delighted to welcome three speakers today. Firstly, Daisy Fancourt will give a short introduction to this research area. And then Karen Mack will present our findings from this work. And we'll also hear from Niels Future, our partner at the World Health Organization, to reflect on what these findings might mean for global policy development. We are in a webinar format today. So whilst we can't see your faces, we'd still love to hear from you. So please use the chat function to share comments and thoughts and use the Q&A function if you have a question. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can during the short Q&A after the presentations, but we may not be able to answer many today. Um, but any questions we don't answer will be answered in a blog post, which we will share on our social media feed at UCL underscore SBB in the next week or two. Please also use this handle to share thoughts about today's session on Twitter. Now, our aim today is to introduce the work we've done in this area and some of our key findings. And it's, of course, in summarising over 70 papers, there'll be loads that we don't have time to cover today. So please do see this session as a starting point from which we encourage you to read the full summary report and, of course, the papers that are of most relevance to you. So without further ado, I'll now hand over to Daisy Fancourt, who will give you a short introduction to this work area. Thanks, Daisy. Thank you so much, Rosie. And it's such a pleasure to be joining you all today. I'm the head of the Social Biobehavioural Research Group at UCL, and we investigate how social connections and behaviours can impact people's health. So this includes looking at social deficits like isolation, loneliness and social restrictions during COVID, and also looking at social assets like the relationships that we have, our engagement with leisure, social prescribing and arts and culture. And this last one, arts and culture, is one of our really key interests, and we're a WHO collaborating centre on arts and health. So we look at the effects of the arts on our health by our four programmes of work. Our behavioural science studies explore how and why people engage in the arts. Our complexity science studies then look at what the ingredients and mechanisms are that link this engagement with our health. We then also have a clinical trials and implementation science programme where we look to develop and test and scale novel arts interventions for particular clinical conditions. And finally, our epidemiological work looks at the population level effect of arts engagement. And it's this last programme that's behind the work we're going to be presenting today. So in 2019, I worked with the World Health Organization and one of my colleagues to complete a scoping review of arts and health literature. And we found over three and a half thousand studies looking at how the arts can play a role in prevention, management and treatment of illness. And the studies that we identified were really diverse in methodology. So they included things like pilot studies, case studies, surveys, ethnographies, randomized control trials. And they were also very interdisciplinary. But there was a lot of evidence that came from relatively small scale intervention studies, so tens or hundreds of people. A lot of the work involved bespoke arts programmes specifically developed for particular clinical conditions. And often people were only followed up for weeks or a few months. So we kept hearing the same kinds of criticisms of the evidence base. There's not enough evidence on the long-term impact. There's not enough statistical power because the samples are too small. Perhaps the samples are biased because they involve people who are willing to engage in the arts for research studies. And also, what about ordinary daily creativity that we do for the fun of it, not necessarily for our health? Can that have an impact too? So naturally, policymakers and practitioners wanted to understand where their funding and providing access to the arts as part of everyday life had benefits across the life course. So in 2017, with the help of a fellowship from the Wellcome Trust, I embarked on an exploration of one of the UK's most amazing assets, which are our cohort studies. So these are random samples of thousands of people who are tracked every few years for their entire lifetimes with measurements of thousands of factors about their demographics, their health, their behaviors, et cetera. So although these were usually set up as medical studies, I actually found that there were hundreds of questions about the arts and other leisure activities buried in these data sets that are typically being overlooked. 
So actually, we were able to use these questions to explore the relationships with a broad range of health outcomes. Now, naturally, as these data are observational rather than experimental, we have to apply increasingly sophisticated statistical methods to make sure that any results that we find aren't simply the result of people who engage in the arts being healthier and wealthier to begin with. So some of the statistical methods that we've involved have included modeling hundreds of different variables together to try and isolate an independent relationship between arts and health, or even simulating randomized control trials using big data. So over the last six years, the evidence that's been coming out of our analysis has got stronger and stronger. And I've been joined by an amazing team of other scientists who've been collaborating on these analyses with the support of millions of pounds of further funding from additional funders. And as Rosie mentioned, we've now published over 70 papers on the long-term impact of arts and cultural engagement on health across the lifespan. So that's why we now felt that the time was right to bring all of these findings together in this new landmark report. And the report summarizes the findings to date in a way that we're going, we hope will be really useful to policymakers who want to understand the impact of their policies to provide funding and access to the arts, as well as being useful to practitioners who want to understand how their work has an impact, and also to others who are in research or funding or commissioning, who might want to understand more about the value of doing more research in this fascinating area. So I really encourage you to look at the full report, which is published today on our website. It's uh, written in lay language, but with very rich detail and visual depictions of our findings. But we wanted to use this webinar to guide you through some of the juiciest things that we found and really consider what the headline findings are. So on that note, I'm delighted to be handing over to my colleague, Dr. Karen Mack, who's a senior research fellow in the group. And she is going to be talking through what some of these findings are. We really encourage you to see this as a dialogue. So as well as us presenting the findings today, we're interested to know how they apply to your work, how you're using them and what questions remain. Because for us, this is very much an ongoing area of research. And we're now undertaking more analyses, not just on data from the UK, but also from around 15 other countries around the world. So there's really exciting papers that we'll be publishing later this year as well. But to kickstart things off, I'm gonna hand over to Karen to show you what we've learned so far to date. Thank you so much, Daisy. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, just give me a moment, please. Great, so I hope you can see my screen okay. So, hi everyone. It's such a pleasure to be presenting to you today. I'm going to be speaking about the relationship between the arts and health across the four key life stages. As Daisy mentioned, in 2019, the WHO has published a report written by Daisy and Sasha Spin from University College London about the role of arts in improving health and well-being. Now, this report shows that the arts and cultural activities combined lots of different components that we know are beneficial to our health. For example, imagination, sensory activation, cognitive stimulation, and social interaction. And these components can prompt psychological physiological, social, and behavioral responses that could help prevent illnesses, manage and treat mental and physical health conditions, and promote healthy behaviors. But as mentioned by Daisy earlier, that many of these studies, including in a report, were cross-sessional, meaning that the arts and health outcomes were measured at a single time point, and that they often had small or targeted samples. We then wondered, that um, whether these benefits of the arts could also be found in a population level and whether the associations that we have been seeing between the arts and health remain after considering lots of different um, individual factors, such as our education and social background. And if so, how long do these benefits last? Now, to explore this, we use data from representative cohort studies that follow participants from their infancy and late adulthood in both the UK and the USA. And with these cohort studies, we were able to measure arts and cultural engagement in many different ways, such as exploring the arts using an umbrella approach, incorporating all assets and activities related to arts and culture or categorizing the activities into groups like active participation and receptive 
um, engagements. We've also analyzed specific activities such as reading for pleasure. So now I'm going to share with you some of the key findings from our research. The, children, the first one is the children and then young people. Now, one research question that we have been very interested in is how the arts could influence children's development relating to self-esteem. And in this analysis, we use the propensity score matching technique, which is a statistical method that mimic conditions in randomized controlled trials that would then allow us to match people with very similar backgrounds who have experienced various levels of arts engagements. And in this study, we found that listening to or playing music, um, drawing, painting and making things or reading for pleasure were associated with higher self-esteem. And their relationship was even stronger if parents also participated in the activities with their children. And similarly, in the US, we explored how arts engagement might influence flourishing, which is a positive mental health state in which individuals feel good and function well in individual and community life. Now, in this analysis, we found that amongst young adults aged 18 to 28, increases in arts engagement were associated with increases in flourishing over a period of 14 years. The associations were predominantly driven by increases in social well-being, meaning that young adults felt like they're part of the community, the positive community, and also smaller increases in psychological well-being, meaning that young adults felt increasing autonomy and personal growth through engaging in the arts. Now, when looking into children's and young people's developmental and social behavior, we found that daily reading for pleasure at age seven was related to lower levels of hyperactivity and better prosocial behavior, such as empathy or helping others at age 11. And these results were consistent amongst children with a history of psychological and behavioral issues. And more importantly, these results were found even though, even when there were no differences in children's social demographic backgrounds parental mental health and relationship between parents and children among these participant children. Now, in addition to reading, we found similar beneficial associations with behaviors for other art activities, such as dancing, music, or performing arts programs. Now, among children in the USA, taking part in a higher number of extracurricular arts activities at age 10 or 11 was associated with fewer externalizing behaviors such as hyperactivity or inattention at age 13 to 14. And again, these results were found even when taking accounts of demographic and socioeconomic factors, as well as factors relating to children's school and its level of overcrowding, ethnic composition, safety of the location and the area. However, unlike extracurricular activities, the same relationship was not found for in-school curricular arts activities. Now, what this is suggesting is that the art, is that the context and environment where children engage in the arts may influence their developmental behaviors differently. Now, this indeed has been highlighted in one of our papers exploring over 130 active ingredients to understand what exactly it is in the activity that triggers mechanisms to take place and connect the art to health such as the content and atmosphere of the activities. Now, this may explain why we found the association in extracurricular arts activities, but not in in-school art classes. To give you another example, creativity is often a common active ingredient found in art activities, for example, drawing and photography. And what we found in this study is that children aged seven who had demonstrated creativity when undertaking art activities had fewer internalizing behaviors, such as being depressed or withdrawal in adolescence. They also had a lower risk of behavioral instability and social and behavioral um, maladjustment. But the risk was even lower if children were showing substantial levels of creativity. So this suggests that it might not just be a case of engaging in the arts, but rather building um, creative skills through the engagement that leads to beneficial effects. 
Now, using a different cohort study where children were born in a different generation, we also found similar results. Children with greater artistic abilities at age 10 showed fewer behavioral difficulties, such as irritability, um, worries, and fights when they reached 16, which may be due to a strong sense of accomplishment and empowerment derived from high abilities in the arts. Behavioral benefits of the arts also extend to health benefits. Now we found that reading for pleasure was related to healthier benefit, uh, behaviors in, in adolescents, including decreased odds of cigarette and alcohol use and greater food consumption at age 14. However, it also corresponded with lower levels of physical activity. Demographic factors, child development, child's mental health, family relationships, and peer influence explain some of the associations. And we also found similar negative relationship between arts engagements and substance use in the US as well, including alcohol, marijuana, and tobacco use. Now, another key focus of our research has been investigating the relationship between arts and health amongst adults. When focusing adults' mental health, we found that the arts have the ability to effectively regulate our emotions that allow people to adapt to daily life. Now, following over 47,000 people, we found three emotion regulation strategies that arts and creative activities can activate. Now, this include avoidance strategies where people use the arts to detach or distract unwanted thoughts or feelings. Approach strategies where people engage in the arts and come to terms with their emotions and to feel more capable of tackling challenges. And also self-development strategies where people enhance self-identity and self-esteem through the engagement. We also looked at what predicted individuals' ability to use these strategies. And we found that factors such as being female, having fewer socioeconomic resources, having previous training in an artistic activity, people who engage regularly and enjoy the activity were related to a greater ability to use these artistic activities to regulate their emotions. And what's also interesting is that we found that these emotion regulation strategies were used by people with depression. Now here we can see great overlaps in the overall use of emotion regulation strategies when engaging in the arts and also with the three types, specific types of strategies used between people with and without depression. So this helps explain why the arts can also benefit people with depression because they have also been using the arts to manage and regulate their emotions. And longitudinally, we found that participating in arts activities and attending cultural events were associated with lower mental distress and better mental functioning. And these benefits were shown if participants engage in arts activities at least once a week. And if you attend cultural events like museums, musical and a theater, as minimal as once or twice a week, we can start seeing an improvement in life satisfaction. Now these results were very robust because the models had already factored in all time constant variables like gender, ethnicity, Personal, personality, past medical history, and important time-changing variables as well, including marital status, age, health behaviors like physical activity, and social support. So this, this result is really strong because it already factors in a lot of these health-related variables when looking at the relationship between arts and cultural engagement and mental well-being. Now, our research has also shown evidence on the benefits of the arts on healthy aging. For example, adults over 50 who increase their community and cultural engagement experience subsequent increases in how worthwhile they felt their lives were. Now, feeling our lives meaningful in older age is very important because it can lead to many health benefits, including better self-rated health, fewer chronic diseases, lower depressive symptoms, lower pain levels, improved functioning, improved immune function, and also lower levels of obesity. 
And these relations are important uh, for how we think about using community and culture engagement for promoting well-being amongst older adults. We also found that visiting to galleries, exhibitions, the theater, concerts, and opera were related to lower levels of loneliness. And such relationship was shown over a 10 year period. And similarly in the US, older adults participated in arts groups such as choir, dance, photography, theater, or music group reported greater life satisfaction, positive effects, and perceived mastery four years later. Now for depression, culture engagement was also shown to help reduce depression amongst older adults. Now let's say if we followed a hundred participants who never engaged in cultural activities for one year, we would expect on average five people being diagnosed with depression during the year of observation. Now this is compared to only 2.3 depression cases amongst those who engaged in these activities once a month or more. So we can already see the difference in depression incidents between people who never engage and those who engage frequently in cultural activities. Now, when compared to people who never or infrequently engage in cultural activities, those who engaged every few months or more had 32 to 48% lower chances of developing depression over the following 10 years. But can this relationship be explained by socioeconomic status? Now, this next study used the propensity score matching to match participants based on their age, gender, and socioeconomic status, and to test whether engaging in cultural activities continues to associate with lower incidence of depression. And the results show that even if we match people based on their sociodemographic backgrounds, engaging with cultural activities continue to reduce the incidence of depression. Now, this suggests that while social background is an important predictor of whether or, of whether or not one engages in cultural activities, it is not an overall explanation for the relationship between cultural activities and depression. And that the protective effect of such engagement can be found amongst people with higher or lower wealth, educational qualifications, and occupational status. Now, cultural engagement may also help improve older people's condition and reduce the risk of dementia. For instance, as part of the cohort study design in the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, participants were invited to complete a semantic fluency test, uh, where participants were asked to think of as many words from a particular category, such as animals, as possible in under one minute. And this study shows that going to exhibitions and going to live performances could have benefits for semantic influence, even after factoring in a range of demographic, health-related and activity-related factors. The study also shows that uh, there may be a dose-response relationship for both gallery or museum and theatre and concert and opera, meaning that the more frequently that we visit these places, the greater benefits that we may receive on cognition. And for dementia, engaging in cultural activities every few months or more was associated with lower risk of developing dementia, even when considering all identified social factors, including marital status, loneliness, social network size, and social support. And in fact, social factors only accounted for nine to 10% of the association between cultural engagement and dementia. So what this is suggesting is that it is not just the case that community engagement or cultural engagement has protective associations just by compensating for a deficit in social interactions. But instead, this study suggests that cultural engagement may have additional cognitive benefits that social factors do not provide. Now, another condition that we have also looked into is chronic pain. Now, particularly whether or not the arts can help prevent the condition. 
And this research of over 2,000 participants showed that all the adults aged 50 or above showed uh, who engaged in cultural events were 25% less likely to have chronic pain within 10 years. And results were comparable to the risk reduction related to vigorous exercise and chronic pain. Not only could the arts prevent the risk of chronic pain, they could also have the potential to support people who were experiencing chronic pain. Now, this study used a US cohort data explore the relationship between engagement in creative and community activities and physical and psychological well-being amongst people uh, with chronic pain and found that for adults experiencing the condition for at least two years, engaging in these activities once a month or more was associated with fewer daily living difficulties, such as bathing, eating, taking medication. And for participants with moderate to severe chronic pain, engagement in these activities monthly or more was associated with greater levels of life satisfaction. And again, these associations have already factored, were found after factoring in a range of sociodemographic factors, as well as their health pro uh, profiles. Now, similarly, older adults who engaged in cultural activities every few months or more had a reduced risk of becoming frail and a slower progression of virality over time. Now, although in this analysis, 83% of older adults engage in culture activities, only 41% do so at the level required for benefits on virality incidence or trajectory to be felt. And such engagement may also promote longevity in older adults. Now, this study followed a nationally representative sample of adults aged 50 or older in England for 14 years and used linked mortality data uh, from National Health Service records. And they found that cultural engagement could have a protective association with longevity in older adults, where the risk of dying at any point during the follow-up periods amongst people who engaged every few months or more was 31% lower than those with no engagement. And this association could partly be explained by differences in cognition, mental health, and physical activity amongst those who do and do not engage in the arts. But even then, the association between culture engagement and mortality remains when these factors were considered. Now, another key focus in our research is exploring the underlying mechanisms to understand how the arts benefits our health. And in this paper, over 600 mechanisms were identified and they can broadly be categorized into four processes. Now, the first process is social process, which means that um, people have been using the arts to help foster pro-social behavior increase social contact and help improve in quality and which then help uh, benefits which then help benefits their health and well-being but people also can can enjoy the benefits of the of the arts through biological process such as increasing brain activation modulate brain biomarkers and change hormone levels as well as lower their pro-inflammatory markers Research has also found that the arts can help improve the health through psychological process, such as in supporting emotion regulation, as we have seen earlier, and also providing meaning and purpose in life and developing um, self-efficacy and self-esteem. And finally, people have been using the arts um, and enjoy the, the health benefits through the arts via behavioral process, including supporting child development, um, behavioral adjustment and also have increases in health behaviors. Now, given the health and well-being effects of the arts, it is very clear that um, it is important that every person has access to them. And alongside our longitudinal research, we have been exploring these inequalities to identify predictors and patterns of arts engagements 
and understand what may be preventing people from engaging in the arts and culture activities. Now, one of the most persistent factors is social demographic factors. We found that, for instance, people of white ethnic backgrounds, those with high education level and high occupational status, and also people who are house owner engaged more in the arts. So a social gradient in arts and cultural participation is very clearly shown. Now, when we extended this analysis to the USA, we found that similar demographic and socioeconomic factors also predicted their arts engagements. Now, we also found that parental socioeconomic status can be a very persistent predictor of our engagement. And this suggests that our class of origin continues to matter throughout the lifespan and that childhood exposure to the arts plays an important role. However, when we explored further how our childhood relationship with the arts could influence our later engagement, we found that school-based art activities can actually remove the social gradients found in the engagement among children, and that such gradient was only shown in outside school. This means that while children from poorer socioeconomic backgrounds tend to engage less outside of school, Inside schools, this is equalized. Now, this provides evidence of how important it is that arts and culture activities continue to be provided in school. On the neighborhood level, where we live may also affect our likelihood in engaging in the arts. Now, in this analysis, we matched participants' household address with the National Postcode Directory data to understand how our engagement rates may be influenced by our residential area. As we would have expected, engagement rate is generally lower in more deprived areas. And these results remained even after considering socioeconomic status. Now, there are also other uh, geographic differences in engagement across the UK. For example, those in the northern parts of England engaged less than those living in the southern part of England. And engagement is also higher in, a, in the countryside than in industrial areas. Now, although the engagement level is lower, we found that the benefits of the arts on mental health may be greater in more deprived areas. So this suggests that improving geographical areas not only help engage people, not only help encourage people to engage. It also has the potential to make people living in deprived and poorer neighborhoods happier. Finally, health-related challenges can also prevent people from engaging with the arts. Now, using the Cone B Behavioral Change Framework, which proposes that motivation, uh, opportunity, and capability um, can help explain people's behaviors, and we found that people with poorer physical health and mental health reported of having fewer skills, capabilities to engage. And those with depression and anxiety reported of lacking motivation. Also, lonely people more likely to report that they have fewer opportunities for them to engage in the arts. Now, identifying the enablers and barriers of engagement across different population groups is important because it can have a significant policy and practice impact in ensuring more inclusive arts engagement practices. So over the last five years, our longitudinal research has demonstrated the influence of arts and cultural engagement on health outcomes over time. We have also shown that benefits of the arts for health exist not just in health interventions, but through daily engagement across our lives. And the implications are profound for population, for population health because this evidence offers policy and practice opportunities for preventing, treating, and managing physical and mental health across society. Thank you so much for listening to the presentation. And I would also like to express my gratitude to the team for uh, producing a lot of excellent and high quality research papers. I will hand over to Rosie now.
Uh, thank you so much, Karen. And you've done such a great job of presenting so much complex information in, in, a, in a whistle stop tour around the links between arts engagement and population health. So I'm really grateful for your generosity and sharing all of that today. Um, now, I'm aware that Karen has shared a lot of information there and some of it quite technical. So um, just to reassure everyone, we will send links around to all of the uh, resources that Karen has mentioned today. Um, we've also produced four short summaries of our findings. So there's one for each of the areas Karen presented today. So there's a short briefing around arts and children and young people development, one on mental health in adulthood, one on arts and healthy aging, and one on access and barriers to arts engagement across the populations. So towards the end of this session, I'll make sure I post a link to each of those in the chat. And of course, the full summary report. Um, so you will have all the resources. And um, if Karen doesn't mind, we'd, we'd also love to share her slides with all of you as well after this. Now, as Karen mentioned, it's really important to think beyond academia with these papers and to think about how the, how the research that we're doing can be useful in policy and practice spaces, not just in the UK and the US where we've looked at this data, but beyond that internationally, globally as well. So with that in mind, I'm pleased to now invite our partner at the World Health Organization, Dr. Niels Pietscher, to share his thoughts on what these findings may mean for international health partners and policymakers. So many of you will know that our group's collaboration with the WHO in recent years led them to grant us the status of a collaborating center for arts and health in 2021. And we're really pleased to be working with Niels and the team to realize the potential for our research to contribute to some global developments in policy and practice. So over to you, Niels. Thank you very much, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, and thank you, Karen, for the fantastic presentation. And of course, thank you to Daisy and her, and her whole team for um, all the work that they've been doing in um, relation to arts and health as part of the social, bi social biobehavioral research group. Um, it's really been a fantastic collaboration. Um, and it's worth mentioning that the WHO Collaborating Center um, on Arts and Health at uh, UCL is the first um, of its kind. And in fact, the report that um, Daisy and her um, colleague wrote for us um, in 2019 has really um, become a bit of a starting shot for uh, this type of work, not only at WHO, but I would say in other um, intergovernmental organizations as, as well. And um, I, I could mention here, for instance, the uh, European Commission as another place that has really um, pricked its ears, so to speak, uh, after the re uh, report was published and um, is really driving further uh, investment into the arts and health space on a European level. And uh, for those of you who are interested, Horizon 2030 is uh, um, is one of those spaces where some uh, um, investment is is being funneled into the relationship between arts and health. So, um, Rosie, as you were saying, there was a lot to to take in from from Karen's presentation, but I do want to draw some. Uh, um, I, I want to highlight a few. Uh, observations that I made, um, at least. Uh, one of those is is just a kind of meta comment, really, and then that's about the importance of life course research um, as a whole. Uh, I think one of the um, one of the fantastic uh, strengths of uh, of the arts and arts and health um, work in, in general is uh, that they operate across the life course um, and that they have influence, not just in particular, not just at the formative stage in life, not just during adulthood, not just at old age, but really across the, the continuum and across the space of, of the life course. And, and um, that's really worth highlighting um, again and again, because at the policy level within organizations like WHO, um, investing in interventions that are effective across the, the um, life course has particular um, benefits. It's uh, uh, often a, a more cost-effective way of uh, um, supporting health. And so I, I really commend this, uh, um, this activity and I really commend the way that in which you're, you're conducting it across the, uh, the, the life course. The other thing I, I wanted to say, you know, an important takeaway um, for, for policymakers is that uh, arts and health is 
activities, whether they are um, direct through interventions or um, indirect through uh, participation, cultural participation, the fact that you're showing again and again that they support well well-being, but also support um, physical health is really vital for um, the, the impact of this field. It's, uh, it's critical that we can keep showing towards a growing evidence base, an evidence base that is growing more and more robust um, also by the, the, the standards of our um, uh, um, science, scientific colleagues. Um, and that we can show to the kind of uh, examples that you are showing to, um, i.e. that uh, the arts can help with regulating emotions, that they can improve mental functioning and life satisfaction, that they can help to reduce chronic pain. And in, in L, at the uh, um, uh, at older adulthood, that they can um, support managing depression and uh, um, and dementia as well. All of these are things that we we know. All of these things are, are things that we are we're, we are aware of. Um, but I think uh, the evidence base, the fact that the evidence base keeps growing in this direction, the fact that you can demonstrate in more and more robust ways that the, these claims are in fact grounded um, in, in research and grounded in, in the evidence is I think a, a tremendous asset when it comes to, to um, creating policies and, and trying to get arts and health integrated um, into health systems. Um, of course, on a, on a kind of policy level, um, there are questions around arts, uh, around arts policy um, and, uh, and, and health policy. I, I, I could probably only speak towards the, the health policy. Um, and that's why within WHO, we are very keen to keep promoting this idea that uh, in particular arts, specifically designed arts interventions can have positive health outcomes uh, and while also being um, low risk and, and often very cost effective. So that's, uh, that's something that we're keen to promote on the health policy level. But within the uh, um, arts and, and, and also the engagement sector, um, I think some of the things that you are showing are, are, are critical, uh, are of critical importance, particularly the, uh, with regards to access to art and, and the need to um, continue providing arts and, and in fact even investing in arts education um, within schools in order to level the playing field um, as it were. So I have, um, before, I, before I finish, I think there's a, there's a couple of things I, I wanna say also in terms of, uh, um, of caveats. Um, one thing and I'd be, if we have time to discuss this, I'd be very curious to, to hear um, what the research is saying uh, about this, but obviously um, there does tend to, to emerge a kind of narrative that certain types of cultural participation um, might be more effective in, than um, other types of cultural participation. And certainly from my perspective, I'm a little bit um, hesitant, um, especially because I work within a health organization. I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to um, move into, a, into terrain where we might be ranking certain types of uh, um, arts interventions as better for health than, than others. Um, my sense here is, is that um, often this is more a, a question um, around personal taste and, and personal um, uh, um, interest and that those things perhaps also need to be taken into account. Um, and that really we're, we're, we're probably not trying to kind of have a top 10 um, or, or any kind of list really of, uh, of cultural participations for to improve uh, um, health. But I, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and, and secondly, I, I wanted to uh, um, I wanted to mention um, a, a question around kind of the the international dimension um, of this kind of work. Obviously, um, the UK is is really a um, a leading uh, country, a leading space within the arts and health uh, um, world. A lot of research is coming from um, the UK. And as you are demonstrating, your, your research is, is, is mainly based on UK and, and also US um, data. Um, and while it might be safe to assume that uh, a lot of these findings transfer into international dimensions, I imagine that, that this is still a bit of an um, unanswered question and um, needs to be um, further, further addressed. Um, certainly from the perspective of, of WHO, 
um, we do have a responsibility towards uh, um, our wider member states to be able to um, confidently say that these kinds of findings translate into um, other cultural contexts uh, um, as well. And perhaps this is also something that we can have a quick uh, um, chat about. But overall, I, I kind of just want to leave on, um, on, a, on a final point. Um, the, the research that UCL and other partners uh, um, throughout the world have been doing in this field is really strengthening a, a, a conclusion that um, has been in the room for a while, which is that the conclusion that, in, um, that the arts have a powerful impact on, on health. And that while there's still for us to, there's still a lot for us to research and, and understand better, we have enough evidence to start moving the dial um, and to start really integrating arts into our health systems. Um, and that's really the, the, the big policy um, push that um, I'm very keen to be part of uh, to try and uh, help uh, reduce some of the stress and some of the burden on our, on our health systems by recognizing the important dimension, the important health dimension that arts can play um, already now. So with that, Rosie, I think I'll, uh, um, I'll hand back to you. Congratulations again on, um, on all the work that uh, um, you have all been doing in this space. Um, and I very much look forward to uh, um, the policy briefs and using the policy briefs in my work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Niels, and thanks so much for sharing those thoughts and lots to ponder there in terms of translating some of this evidence into practice, not just obviously here in the UK, but internationally as well. So thank you. And thank you for your ongoing support of this work and, and of our team as well. Um, we do have some questions. So we've got a bit of time now for Q&A. You do have thoughts and questions. Please do pop those in the chat. And I've written a couple down. They're, they're probably mostly for you, Karen. <laughs> so if you're uh, if you're happy to answer some of these, that would be great. Um, so Emily has asked whether, um, obviously we've used some of the cohort data from the UK and some from the USA, and were there any differences that we noticed? So to Niels's point about how this, these sorts of findings do, do replicate or not internationally, do you have any thoughts on that from the work that you've done? Yeah, so um, thank you for the question. Um, so in the, uh, when we look at when we use different data set from the UK and USA, we do find that the, the engagement in the arts have a universal health benefits on people, uh, which is a very encouraging finding because we know that regardless where you're from or regardless of the social backgrounds, the arts can also have the benefits um, to people. But I think what's more interesting question is that um, whether the access to the arts vary greatly between these two countries and what would be the main um, barriers and enablers, because I um, I believe that the enablers and barriers to engagement would vary greatly between countries and cultures, and whether the barriers can be found on an individual level, like socioeconomic status, or is it something to do with the country predicted levels, like the World Happiness Index or Life Satisfaction? Thank you. So, um, Kerry also had a question about some of our research around children and young people, and specifically those children and young people who are already experiencing high internalizing and externalizing behaviors, so problems with their social behaviors or, or mental health, and whether extracurricular arts decreases this pro these problems. So have we done anything on that? Is there anything in the findings that could help us there? Yes, so um, in one of the uh, presentation slides, which I'm very happy to share later, uh, shows that the extracurricular arts activities can help improve um, internalizing symptoms and behaviors as well. Great, thank you. And also around uh, creativity and arts activities for younger children, Helen has asked whether we could say a bit more about how we've made the distinction between cohort and um, between arts activities and activities which show creativity, um, because I know that it's difficult sometimes to look at these things in cohort studies. It very much depends on the questions that were asked at the time, and then we have to draw certain inferences from those. Um, but I think there, there was quite a clear distinction between how we understand arts participation and children displaying creative um, skills or tendencies. So can you just say a bit more about how we got there? Yes, sure. So. Um... 
Um, so if I understand correctly, the, the questions about the creative arts activities and full creativity versus those without creativity elements, yes. Yeah, I think it's how we understand those things differently. So I think I think it's it's talking about how we how we could identify those children who are displaying creative behaviours, and is that different from those children who are participating in arts activities? Right. I hope I've got that right, Helen. But just pop in the chat if I haven't. <laughs> yeah. uh, right. So um, in the cohort studies, uh, actually, they ask questions about um, they ask children's teachers about their creativity. So things like imagination um, and also uh, novelty creativity that the, the teachers think about their children. And we use those measures to quantify and to understand um, the levels of creativity of the children and then to see uh, whether uh, the creativity that engaged um, when they undertake when they undertaking the art activity would be related to external and internal symptoms and behaviors okay um yeah so it's, it's quite still quite subjective isn't it it's having the teachers decide which of the children are displaying creativity but i think sometimes that highlights some of the limitations of working with cohort study data as well in that there's not really any other way to understand that so even though it's an imperfect definition it may be the best we have at the moment Definitely. And sometimes we have multiple reporters as well. So they also ask parents, um, how do you think your, your children's uh, creativity or arts abilities are? And then so we, we can compare the teacher's ratings and the parents' ratings and to come up with a more objective measures for children's creativity and artistic ability. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm just having a quick look at the chat to see what else is in here. I think this might be a good question for you, Neil. So um, Nicola has asked, is, as there is now such good evidence, why do individual arts organisations still need to provide evidence of their impact in order to secure, say, funding or, or maybe from your perspective um, in getting this, you know, higher up the agenda of, of policymakers and governments? Thanks, Rosie. So <clears throat> I, I would um, I would look at the silver lining here. Um, I, I think in a way you can, you know, th those are the cultures in and of themselves, the, the, the kind of funding culture of trying to, uh, or, you know, asking for impact um, is something difficult to change. But I think there's an opportunity here to point to the research that demonstrates this type of uh, um, uh, arts, you know, this type of health impact. So I, I would look at it from the other way around. I think it's unlikely that that in funding applications and, and uh, um, research applications and so forth, that one one can um, remove. And I don't just mean at the at the university level. I also mean at the, the kind of communal level. Uh, you know, the types of applications that you mean museums might have to uh, um, put together in, in order to to receive funding. I think it's unlikely one can change the culture of uh, of uh, um, you know uh, um, being asked about impact. But at least one now has uh, um, an additional um, uh, element to draw on through the work that you guys are doing through the work of the arts and uh, sorry the WHO report, uh, where one can point to um, the the impact that the arts have on health as well. Yeah, I agree. It's always good to think about the different perspectives of the evidence and also the the different spe the spectrum of this type of work. So, you know, you've got arts in arts projects happening in clinical settings, and then this sort of there's a spectrum right through to what we're talking about today was just this kind of general arts and culture um, engagement and um, I'm paraphrasing one of the questions in the Q&A here Niels but um, someone's asked about about how we think we can turn the evidence into action you've already said a lot about that but it would be good to hear what the WHO's next steps are so what the kinds of things that you and your team are working on mm. at the moment, helping to progress this work. Yeah, so I think there there are a couple things. One of them is perhaps a more kind of direct direct forms of action, which is to try and um, to try and see how some of the, particularly with regard to um, arts and health interventions that have been designed in one local or cultural context, to try and see how those can be uh, how effective those continue to be in other um, uh, cultural contexts. And so we're um, running a kind of multi-site 
um, arts and health uh, implementation study, uh, which uses music and motherhood, uh, an intervention designed for mothers who are experiencing postpartum depression. And we're running that in, in, in several countries in the WHO European region to see uh, what challenges exist in, in terms of implementing this, uh, um, this intervention in other, uh, other cultural contexts, other languages, other um, local settings. Uh, and from that, I think we're, we're keen to learn about how, how do we actually op operationalize arts and health um, interventions in other country contexts. So that's on the kind of um, uh, the, the, the specific um, level. On the larger level, um, given what, what, what we are learning more and more about in, in relation to the impact of arts uh, on health, we're keen to also um, work uh, with regard to social prescribing to uh, or, or some form of, uh, of that. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be social prescribing, but, but um, figuring out mechanisms by which arts and health interventions can actually be integrated into health systems. So um, WA, uh, colleagues at WHO recently put together a toolkit on um, social prescribing in, in health systems, and we're keen to work with more and more um, member states throughout the region to try and explore how such mechanisms might be integrated into um, into health systems. And social prescribing also, you know, it is much broader than just arts activities. Of course. But, um, but, you know, we are very interested in this in our research group as well. So we haven't shed much on it today, but we do have a major clinical trial going on at the moment around social prescribing for young people on uh, waiting lists for CAM support in the NHS. So it's a, a large randomized trial across 10 sites um which again we can share more links in the chat um and encourage you to have a look at our new website as well so before i sum up i just want to ask karen one final question about the direction of travel for this research um and for this this body of research here here within our group what are the next steps for us yeah so um one of the so we have been working on multiple projects um so one of the focus will be on the social prescribing particularly in children and, and young people. So what we will be um, doing will be to look at um, whether social prescribing schemes also can, the benefits of social prescribing schemes can also be found in children and young people with mental health conditions, um, as well as the predictors of, the, of, the, of, taking, um, of taking part in the social prescribing schemes. Another focus uh, would be on the international comparisons. So we'll be comparing um, the arts engagements across different countries, um, where including the impacts of this engagement in different health outcomes, including physical and mental health outcomes, as well as the predictors and enablers or factors um, in, in engaging in these activities across countries. Fantastic. Thank you. And then I think that's just about all we've got time for. So I want to say thank you to Aaron and to Niels and to Daisy, of course, who has uh, who has since, since left us, but we're very, very glad to have her um, dialing in from her mat leave today to join us. And a, a huge thank you to all of you who've engaged in the webinar, both through listening and through participating in questions. We've had many more questions than we could answer. So rest assured, we will be following up with a short blog post where we'll I'll get Karen to answer some of these questions um, and we'll share that out on our Twitter feed and on our website. So, um, so thank you so much again, everybody. And uh, you'll get an email from all of us with all the follow-up stuff. I popped a link in the chat to the main resources from today as well. So please, as Daisy says, do keep getting in touch with us either via Twitter, via our website, or via email for any potential future collaborations. Um, or if we can make this more presentable to you or helpful to you in any other way, then please do let us know. And wish you a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.